Hello and welcome to the Perception versus Reality presentation. Today I want to ask you the question that are we losing the cyber war or we just simply give the field to the cyber criminals on our own wish? To answer that question, let me introduce myself and to show you the angle I want to present this answer to this question. So, my name is Piotr Pobereżny and I'm senior, uh, senior security solution architect in Qualys. But previously, before that position, I was holding uh, a group CISO position in two big insurance companies. So, I want to blend in those two angles into one presentations from the vendor perspective, but of course, from the CISO perspective. But enough talk, let's fight. So first, let me introduce the idea behind of creation of these slides, of this presentation. So I came across this slide or this cartoon created by Joe Vest, and this is a pinpoint for me how the perception works in the majority of the organizations. So they are spending a lot of tough effort actually to end up with a completely unmanageable and completely ineffective solutions. Most of the C-level uh, executives in the companies thinks if they have an antivirus, they have a insurance and they have a, maybe some firewalls. So they are solved. So why? They need to spend more money, more effort for the security. Well, if you look on the right side of the screen, this friendly but not friendly guy in the black hat is simply not disturbed. And this guy can do whatever it will, whatever it wish to do with our uh, environments because we are not managing the environment in effective way. So what's the reality? Let's play a game about that. So how do you think? What's the real average coverage of the vulnerability management program in your organizations? Including all type of devices, including all type of software on these devices. How many, how many of them are effectively covered and managed uh, across your environment. So, from the perspective uh, of various companies, of various types of companies, I, I, I had a, um, I have experienced this number is very, very low. It's about 12% and 12% only that the area is managed in any way. The rest of the environment is completely unmanaged. So if there is any vulnerability out there and if they are exploitable or not, they simply are left behind. So we don't have an ability or capacity to manage them. So why is that? Why is happening like that? To answer that question, I want to play a game with you, which in my country, in Poland, is called Familiada. So I created somehow this kind of game for cybersecurity experts. It will be very short, but the questions, one of the questions is, what type of software in most of the companies have the biggest number of vulnerabilities with the public exploits? And this, in general, I want to focus in. I want to focus on the vulnerabilities which consist or, or, or public exploits are available for those vulnerabilities so they can be easily detonated in the, in the organization. So let's make a list. Based on my experience, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that your experience may be also familiar. Most of the companies are focusing on the operating system, on patching and the managing the vulnerabilities on the on the operating systems in the first place as a, as a first uh, attack surface and the most serious especially in the in the internet facing productional uh, service which is true 
This is very true. But in terms of the priority, in terms of question we are asking here, the, about the type of software that have the biggest numbers of vulnerabilities with the public access, which actually, from my perspective, is posing exponentially bigger threat than the vulnerabilities themselves. So how do you think? Where you should put the operating systems on this list in terms of the priorities across, based on that questions? Is it like a first position, second, third, maybe other? So in terms of the number of, of vulnerabilities with the public exploits, the operating systems are on the priority number 11. So what is next? Let's make it short. What do you think? Where you should put Java? Java is known to be vulnerable. Java is known to, to have a prop to be problematic in the organizations, to be to be remediated because most of the software requires the specific version of it, and it's just like a semi-unmanageable. But first and foremost, it's a not a biggest threat in organizations, and definitely it's a not a low-hanging fruit. So Java is exactly in the middle. But I want to focus with you solely on the top three. How do you think? What type of software have the biggest number of exploits in the uh, in ma majority of the organizations? And to, to make it precise, I want to mention that we are calculating also by volumes. I mean, by numbers of instances on how many machines, uh, on how many workstations, on how many servers, on how many devices we have this type of software installed. So the number one is my favorite, Adobe products. It's a flash, it's an Adobe reader. So, and this, is, and this is the low hanging fruit because in most of the cases we need not a specific version like Java, but we need the last most updated latest version. And in some of the cases we don't need at all let's say Adobe Flash, so why not to remove it? And okay, but let's focus on the list of the type of softwares with, which have consists of the most um, uh, amount of the vulnerabilities. Number two, what do you think? It's a internet browsers. It's a Chrome, Firefox, Internet Explorer, Edge, many others, but those three are the most popular. So. There, those are also low hanging fruits, so it is very easy to remedy that also, despite the threat is biggest. Because mo in most cases, once again, we need the most current version of it. So, my favorite point on this list is point number three. So, once again, we are calculating the vulnerabilities which are calculated and multiplied by the volume on on how many machines, on how many assets, this threat, these vulnerabilities, and thus vulnerabilities which consist public, uh, can be detonated by the public exploits, are present. And this area is virtually in, or uh, area, the software, is virtually on every machine in your, in your organizations. Do you have a clue? It's an Intel graphics card drivers because Intel graphic card chipset is installed in virtually every workstation in the organization in most cases. What's moreover, most of the servers also consist the very same graphic chipset. So the question is how many companies are actively tracking and remediating vulnerabilities regarding the drivers for the graphic cards, which are vulnerable which are vulnerable with the vulnerabilities with the public exploits and can be easily detonated and the environment can be easily uh, compromised based on that. So that's my favorite part out, out of this game. So once again, why is happening like that? Why the situation is so, let's say, scary? Of course, we have a very complex environments we have multiple hybrid architecture in our organizations. We have uh, networks, virtual machines, physical machines. We have uh, databases. We have a uh, storage. We have uh, containers. We have uh, 
co-located data centers in various environments. We have uh, multiple locations, remote offices. We have uh, tons of people working uh, at home at this very moment, which is also a complex situation. We have a uh, cloud solutions that are gradually being implemented in the organizations. We have a mobile work workforce and so on. But most threats in here is also that because we are cutting off some entire domains because of the cost reducing and we are cutting out the visibility we are cutting out the ability to manage vulnerabilities or at least to see them through the volumes because the process is not capable capable to digest them in the in these areas so how to solve that situation first we need to grow sensors to respective uh, areas. We are not scanning. We are detecting by the sensors, by the container the connectors, with, by the cloud connectors, and so on. So we don't need to spend the time for detection itself because detections, detections are being in real time and all changes are being reported to the platform without consuming the resources of the machine. So while we have it, we can create the proper vulnerability management lifecycle. And this, what we call, we call it the real-time vulnerability management. So first, we need to have an asset inventory. So this is, the funny question is always uh, being asked in this moment that some of the companies have a CMDB database. And the second question is, how many of those companies have a fully upda updated and fully managed data in the CMDB? Well, it's doable for here. While we have asset inventory, while we see all assets in the environments, in the different environments, we can do the vulnerability management on them. We can assess the vulnerabilities. That's the very moment that most of the companies are dying. They are cutting off the asset inventory to shape the flow and the volume of the vulnerability on the on the vulnerabilities in vulnerability management to be better capable to manage them. Well, okay, but not okay. The crucial point is to prioritize them and to assess them from the risk perspective, and I will show you that in a moment. Uh, to be able to manage across the priorities. And I'm not saying the priority in terms of, let's say, severity five, because all severity fives and, uh, are equally important, but some of them are exploitable. Some of them are not patchable. Some of them are hitting for the end of life, end of support uh, type of software machines and so on. So this requires different approach, different pace and so on. But we have one, block missing in, in, in this picture. So we need a consistent remediation in that, embedded in one solution. Because if we are splitting up into the pointed solutions, we are losing the track, we are losing the pace, we are losing the velocity that be able to manage that efficiently. So how to achieve that? As I said, to deploy the different sensors to the different needs of the uh, companies, it's a crucial part. But after that, we may have the real-time view. So first, what we have on the screen, this is what I called the epicenter of the, of the solution. This is the epicenter that actually from this very point, we can manage the priorities and we can manage and speed up and automate um, the velocity that we are pacing with, a, uh, with the vulnerabilities. So based on that, let's focus on the Windows workstations. Based on that, we have 401 machine. Based on that, we have more than 100,000 of vulnerabilities. And I'm saying solely about the confirmed vulnerabilities. 
you see the breakdown that the criticals and highs are the vast majority of them. But to be able to prioritize that, I, I put the real-time threat indicators, RTIs, based on that, to filter out which I think at this very moment the most important. Of course, it can be a public exploit. It can be any type you want to focus on. At this very moment, I selected four of them. Which of vulnerabilities consist of malware? Which of uh, vulnerabilities are vulnerable? Which of the vulnerabilities uh, are prone to be active attacks? And consist of active kit. Based on that RTI, based on that real-time threat indicator, which I can change dynamically, in, in, I can get results in a few seconds because if I will change it, I will get the new results recalculated in a couple of seconds. Of course, I have also breakdown in terms of the dates because I have automated information how old the vulnerabilities are. And I can focus also through this perspective to them. Based on that, based on that filters I applied here, I get the picture that actually 98% over 98% of the mm, uh, uh, machines are still vulnerable. Okay, that means that the, almost all, but I have out of over 100,000 vulnerabilities through this focus to this prioritization, I have 18,000 of them. And actually, because I have a big number of uh, uh, assets, they are only 352 unique vulnerabilities that I want to focus in the first place, which actually is less than 80% of the total scope. And this percentage is very important to so-called dialects that I will be focusing in a moment. But the most important from this screen is that I can close the process, as you probably remember, from the asset inventory, through the vulnerability management, through the prioritization, to the remediation. So one place that I click it, that I, that I can click it, is that I can patch them now. Actually, it's just not like a, I will push that button and the patches will be installed, of course. It's a part of the process that you can manage them in automated way, in volumes, but according to your process, you can create the patch job according to your schedule. If, is, is it like a regular maintenance window, which will be, let's say, as a patch Tuesday, is an, an emergency patching that you need to deploy as fast as possible. You may have the situation that you have ad hoc patching, like internet browsers, like graphic card drivers, like Adobe readers, and so on. So based on that, you can create a job that actually will be safe and stored in Qualys and can be enabled by the admin responsible by the part of the environment because this job will be will be targeted to their to, to his or her machines and this will be exactly the same that admin is doing that manually the difference will be that the context will be prepared, the patches will be prepared, the patches will be downloaded, and the patches will be ready to deploy directly in this platform. So you don't need external tools actually to manage that. Well, speaking of so, how do you think? What would be the best time to remediate you can imagine based on the real-time threat management or real-time vulnerability management. And I need to mention here that I'm using the TTR, not an MTTR, the mean time to resolution. Because if we have a resolution time for as, as average, we, ha we may have the vast majority, uh, vast majority of the uh, vulnerabilities covered very quickly, but some of them will stay obsolete for a very, very long period of time. That's why I'm, I'm using the t real time to remediate. And how do you think, what would be the best? What will be the best time to remediate? Well, it's zero. In moment that you see the vulnerability, 
you may have ability to remediate that almost instantly. Well, and speaking of so, I have a bonus for you. I have a, I was mentioning about the dialects of the cybersecurity. So let me cover that. Let me cover how to drag the attention of those which have been presented on the very first slide from Joe Vest, those which actually are making an end, let's say ultimate decisions in the every organization because they are in charge of releasing the budget. They are charge of accepting or let's say addressing the risks based on the cybersecurity. So let's play with that. We have basically three options. Most of the companies react like that. That's my favorite example. Most of you recall that organization and most of you recall that orga that organization was, was a, let's say, a victim of a non petty attack, which happened some time ago. And this company actually, <laughs> this screen, this, this yellow, um, green or blue uh, screen that, that, that the IT systems are down as the direct screenshot for the main page of this company that actually they are went to home because everything went down. This company was a, like a, this, this breakdown was an effect of the two areas. First, they had a branch office in the Ukraine, Ukraine. And unfortunately, the non petty attack was targeted to that country. Based on that, the second let's say, factor, factor of disaster was that the top management decided to not to invest in the cybersecurity because we are not a bank or whatever the decision were, what there was. But the outcome was quite, quite serious. They went completely down. They went into the severe problems and very costly problems across globally, ac across the global, global structure. I have more examples of that and more, more, more companies, but we don't have a time space to present them. <laughs> Some of the situations were, were quite funny, but nevertheless, having the automated vulnerability solution can save a lot of money. And actually, this very company is a very good customer now with a fraction of the money they lost by the previous decisions. Well, option number two, we have a manual mold. And this is the most favorite, most common situation in the com situation in companies I, I'm observing. Well, are you familiar with that? Are you familiar with the Excel file, comma separated file, XML file, any flat file that is an outcome of the regular classic approach, a regular scan, the appliance scan, the scanner that actually throwing back the information about the vulnerabilities? Well, we can change this view to the table. We have a severity five in this number, we have a severity four in this number, etc. And still I'm playing with the only confirmed vulnerabilities. I'm showing away the potential one to make this uh, view more clear. And going further, we have a view like that. Is it manageable? We have those per percentage. We have a those um, numbers in the company. How we can focus on the vulnerabilities that actually are manageable which of them are exploitable? Which of, which of those are have, a, let's say, exploit kits, are able to, um, to steal our data, uh, have a very high lateral movement, et cetera, and, and so on. We don't have a context with that. And the outcome of it with this manual mode is that even though we are reporting that to the executives, as this report, let's say, a, 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 as an example, we still have a, a flat line. So the new flow of the vulnerabilities overpassing our successes of remediation. So our risk is still the same. We are not coping 
with the flow of the vulnerabilities. So we are giving out the space. And the last option, the proactive mode. Let me show you that this way. Most of you most likely remember 2017 when the WannaCry breach has materialized. So instead, in some of the companies, the execu executives were asking, how are we standing across this vulnerability? I remember one of the company that ha actually had to scan against this particular vulnerability, uh, especially across entire organization in every country they had a branch. Well, that was a gruesome task. While you have the detections, you have this information at hand. It can be any vulnerability you may ask and you will get the dashboard similar to this. Well, speaking of so, I want to focus on the two types. Let me make it bigger a bit, okay? I want to focus on the threat indicators I was showing you previously on the epicenter slide. I want to show those two. The, patch, uh, the uh, vulnerabilities or assets on which have, uh, have the unpatchable vulnerabilities because most likely they are out of date, end of life, end of support. And the second one with the assets with the potentially high data loss vulnerabilities. And I want to put a thesis in here. If you will agree with me, if I will say, if there will be any type of successful data breach in the company, and there is a most likely that during that breach, the personal data will be stolen along. So I hope that you agree with me on that because I want to show you the example based on that, uh, let's say, statement. And let's go to the details. The unpatchable vulnerabilities, well, as you can see, most of them are end of life, but low hanging fruits. We have Adobe Flash Player, we have App, uh, Apple QuickTime, um, which is actually RCA, uh, remote code execution type of vulnerability. Mm, uh, we have many others, which are like a low hanging fruits, like an Internet Explorer, and so on. So we can focus on them. And instead of looking on them, which are actually not patchable, we can remove them in automated way and install the new version if we need them or simply remove because you can ask, you can ask the, uh, uh, let's say a question. If I need a Apple QuickTime on my machines, you can track for a Bitcoin miners and check if they are yours or not others, for example. And the second area, the assets with the potentially high data loss vulnerabilities. In the very same way, as you can see, the most and foremost vulnerabilities that there are in this uh, area are related to, to my favorites regarding Adobe Flash, uh, Player, Adobe Reader, and so on. As you can see, there's even the Cisco WebEx extension, which is also so vulnerable and may lead to data leak. Of course, you can read across the CVE and you will get the details, but everything is in interactive in here. But I want to focus on the dialect going from that because this view is highly technical and this is highly, let's say, geek for the management and completely, um, let's say, not clear what you may want to uh, pass, what information I want to give uh, based on that. But I want to focus on the percentage here and I'm calling that GDPR infrastructure compliance because of the data loss, potential data loss that we may have. And speaking of so, most of the companies are reacting like that if I'm mentioning or anyone is mentioning about the GDPR. But let's try, let's give a shot. This is how I perceive GDPR in most of the cases, any, 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 uh, let's say comprehensive uh, presentation I've seen about the GDPR itself is consisting multiple angles. Some of the companies are focusing on the legal constraints and actually they are adding the quotes into the contracts and they are safe. 
well <sighs> that's the question are we treating the gdpr seriously but actually we can put anything on top of that it don't need to be a gdpr it can be the adobe readers internet drivers whatever the the ability to to um uh to uh compromise the endpoint through the mail through the browser through anything which is actually the most common and most successful attack vectors but i want you to ask the question this question in case of a real data breach how do you think who will be fired first the top executives that actually made the decision to do nothing about that or the security specialists or IT specialists that actually, well, <laughs> were not able to report that, report it in the first hand. So I know the question to that. <laughs> actually, I've seen that on my on my very own eyes several times. It was quite painful, and believe me, it was not the executives. So let me present the example. This is a lot of text, but I want to focus on the con concept. This is a detailed GDPR report based on the policy compliance, based on the uh, good practices, based on the ISO 27001 and, and the CIS top 20 critical security controls across that, because we have a map in between the articles, in between the resolutions and and those good practices because the map exists. So we can calculate that in an automated way. I can make a breakdown in the consolidated mandate, mandate posture, in the mandate posture breakdown, it's on blah, 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 whatever it is inside. But I want to focus on the one thing. On the left side, I'm using the good standards. Good standards that actually bring us to the due diligence that is like a, we cannot negotiate. With the good standards because they are there they are globally acclaimed like uh, iso 2701 tis benchmarks like uh, uh, microsoft hardening standards and so on and this is the second point that i want you to show you i don't want to show the entire report it is not important i want to present that the compliance level is actually 46 percent do you remember the yellow one from uh, from the technical perspective that one is a, from the policy compliance perspective so my dialect and my answer to the executives is like that which is automated because i'm calculating that on daily basis in automated way this is how compliant we are and how far in the reality we are from the perception of the compliance of the top management. And this can be easily transformed, transformed into the risk, into the operational risk that you can put along with a financial, uh, rep, uh, reputation, uh, like a finance reputation and uh, legal threats or risks in the organization. This is a fact we cannot challenge the facts but we can make actions on them the top management may want or may not want to act on that but still we are protecting the environment by presenting the risks in the appro uh, appropriate dialect those numbers are easily uh, they are very easy to understand by the top management they can do educated actions based on that. They cannot do this on the uh, exploitable severity five remote code execution vulnerability on the whatever it is inside. But they are focused on that. And you can build that. I, I, I gave the example of the GDPR, but actually you may have uh, any type of, uh, of the problem you uh, may exist in the organization like end of life end of support systems you may say that 51 percent of your environment is unmanageable because of end of life you cannot update the systems you need to build 
a project for migration to another version. So, based on that, you want to achieve one thing. You want to achieve a situation when you will see the vulnerabilities across the entire environment, not this 12% we started from, not from the any other numbers. You want to see them all at once, but you will be able to manage them all at once and converting them to the risks that actually top management, those C-level executives will be able to understand in their dialect and make actions on that because the risk will be theirs. The actions will be theirs. Either is a patching process, if existing, if possible. If there is a uh, active, let's say, migration needed from the, I don't know, Windows Server 2012 to the Windows Server 2016, from the SQL 2005 to the newer version, and so on, whatever it is, you may want to achieve this by creating the background, the, like a baseline for the top management to actually to understand what they need to invest to actually to make it happen. Because otherwise they will say, okay, I have an IT security guy, I have an IT guy, I, I, it's not my problem, it's not my risk. But when you will pose that, when you present that in the form of the risk, not the vulnerability, you will drag the attention. The prerequisite is that you need to see all visible, all vulnerabilities, but to convert them, not like a 10,000 pages uh, report, but to the one comprehensive percentage number. And that's the area I want you to guide. So this is it. That's all from my side. Thank you very much for, uh, for your time and I'm open to your questions. Thank you.